Good evening from Yerevan and good morning to our compatriots in the U.S. and rest of the diaspora tuning in. This is Hasmik, live from the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. And in just a few moments, we'll be chatting with High Commissioner Zara Simanyan about his recent trip to the United States, as well as some program updates and those regarding COVID-19 regulation and the upcoming elections. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the floor to High Commissioner Zara Simanyan uh, to start the presentation. Hasmik. Thank you, Hasmi. Uh, good morning to our compatriots in the English part of the world. Glad I have this opportunity to provide a brief update on our trip to the United States that took place about 10 days ago and provide a general update of what's happening in Armenia as well. Um, uh, this was a pretty extensive trip starting on the East Coast, including. Washington, D.C., um, New York, New Jersey, Boston, and then Los Angeles area. And during those meetings, uh, uh, during the, the, the trip, we had numerous meetings, both religious and governmental organizations, community organizations, uh, also uh, folks with uh, influence opinion makers. United States. And the purpose of the visit really was to reignite the physical connection between the Office of the High Commission of Diaspora Affairs and our American diaspora because as a result of the COVID virus as well, there is disruption that has taken place. And uh, we'll be able to overcome the limitations that have been imposed upon us by COVID and this connection organic connection between the diaspora and the world to be um, established. The first leg of the trip was in Washington, D.C., where we had uh, the opportunity to meet with uh, the head of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, as well as the Army Ambassador. United States of Arjun and discussing numerous community and intergovernmental issues. These individuals had a pleasure to meet with His Eminence Archbishop uh, Etienne and exchange their ideas on where we are, where we're moving, and what needs to be done. Um, the trip in DC was very short in reality. And the next leg of the trip was New York, New Jersey area, where we had numerous meetings, including with the AGBU, the Armenian Engineers and Scientists of America, St. Illuminators Armenian Apostolic Cathedral, the Armenian Bar Association, Permanent Mission of Armenia to the UN, the Genetian Foundation, Armenian American Health Professionals Association, and the NGO Committee on the Status of Women, to name just a few. I have to say that. Um, it was really nice to see that in this very difficult time for Armenia and our people, most of these organizations, actually every organization that we had meetings with, wanted to double down, redouble their efforts, and um, join hands with the people of Armenia to overcome this difficult situation. Um, also, I'm very appreciative of everyone that I had a meeting with because in the U.S., as you all know, especially on the East Coast, this was easy to observe. The COVID restrictions were very uh, stringent still, nothing like Armenia, and many of the meetings took place in an atmosphere where folks come, were being brought together as a result of the meeting. They hadn't seen each other for a year. They only conversed through either Zoom or the phone and were I happy to come out and venture having small meetings with limited numbers of people. So I, I appreciate that as well. Um, otherwise, you know, we did discuss specific plans with specific organizations. We presented our plan of action, our agenda, our programming, what we're going to move forward with this year, and. Uh, Various organizations saw their role in these programs. For example, the Genetian Foundation was 
grateful, gra uh, graciously agreed to help finance our new Diaspora Youth Ambassadors Program, which is uh, intended to bring 25 young adults to the homeland for an exploratory educational and preparatory trip. Um, and we're looking forward to having this first ever leadership program, ambassadorship program, which will take place in uh, September of this year. And we're grateful that like the program enough to initiate. In New Jersey, um, I met with the Hovnanyan Armenian Schools Administration and the children. It was a great pleasure to see our kids going to school and to discuss how the schools are faring <coughs> these difficult COVID times. And um, had a meeting with the Armenian Missionary Association of America. Um, during the Hovnanyan uh, trip, we discussed programs. Uh, potential change programs, which uh, as when they when we have final agreement with the school. But uh, the trip was very, again, very fruitful. Nice to thank the whole menu of toughing it out through COVID and actually coming out in a much better shape than we were before COVID. And uh, from New York, New Jersey, I moved on to Boston area where I had a meeting with the Armenian International Women's Association, the Armenian Museum of America, Project Save Armenian Photograph Archives, National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, as well as the Armenian Business. Uh, again, during these meetings, we discussed not just general plans, not just our agenda and our programming, but also any avenues of cooperation that may take place between the Office of the High Commission.
Hello, everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulties. I don't know if you can see behind me or hear behind me, but there's crazy thunder and lightning um, in Kerevan currently. Uh, but I'd like to pass the floor back again to Mr. Zinanyan to continue from uh, his visit to New Jersey. Okay, I'm back on, and uh, actually we were on Boston. So, um, as I was, I believe, I was saying that not not only do we discuss plans, but also talk about actual programming and how any of the organizations partner in those programs. And for example, with Nasser, we discussed various programs and with uh, Armenian Business Network as well. And the Business Network was uh, willing to organize management courses for Armenians in the public sector. A need that is very clear and apparent to many of us and very grateful to the Armenian Business Network for undertaking such a training program. Uh, moving on to Los Angeles, again, a large number of meetings for various organizations such as High Hopes, uh, Armenian Evangelical Union, Artec, or the Kindergarten, so those of us who visited visit the school in New Jersey, we wanted to visit the younger ones in Los Angeles. Also met with the board of the Armenian Education Foundation, the Armenian Medical International Committee, uh, the AESA's uh, Los Angeles board, the uh, ARPA Institute, High ID Initiative, 100, the, as well as a new organization called LA Lao. Uh, I also want to mention the seminars of Ander Derian, who we visited at the, um, uh, at the diocese uh, and discussed all relevant issues. Again, thank the Archbishop. Willingness and readiness to uh, aid us with any programs bring and diaspora closer together. Uh, also met with uh, various officials in uh, Los Angeles, some of them uh, old friends and colleagues of mine, and discussed all the um, I want to specifically mention. Senator Anthony Porton, uh, and we also discussed the opening of the California Trade Office in the moment, which will take place uh, next week. And of course, we owe um, the creation of this office to Senator Porton. You know, and so glad that this is finally coming to fruition. Uh, the issues that were discussed were many of them education programs, mutual visits, educational meetings, exchange of ideas, online training, healthcare, a very important, relevant issue, always, but also in the past year and a half, both due to COVID as well as war last year. Um, issues of uh, helping Armenia its own uh, defense, means of defense, and fortunately the diaspora both in the East and the West is increasingly more and more involved with this, realizing the need for such indigenous production. Uh, research to better be prepared for the challenges of tomorrow. Uh, cultural, uh, talking about uh, not only the preservation of Armenian culture in the past, but also preservation of Armenian culture uh, in our historic uh, lands and, and some of the territories that are now occupied by Azerbaijan. Uh, talked about the investment projects, as well as investments in the professional sphere in Armenia. Uh, also, the elimination of legal and constitutional obstacles to deeper in involvement of diaspora Armenians in Armenia, and uh, again, the development of uh, management skills, uh, 
uh, in Armenia, which are in much need of, as was demonstrated in the last several years. Uh, I want to um, specifically mention that one project that was talked about a lot is our EGORTS program. Uh, and EGORTS program's 2021-2022 year is now currently in the process of interviews. We're setting up the interviews with the various candidates and also various jurisdictions that these candidates will be looking for if they are to pass the uh, interview competitive stage of the process. So I don't want to jump around, but let me talk about some of the programs that have existed in the past or that are new and we're moving forward with and given a status update on those. Our application process for the EGOS program, uh, I'm sorry, for the uh, Debbie Doom program uh, closed on May 1st. We have uh, more than 500 applicants. Unfortunately, currently we don't have the budget for uh, don't have the budget for everyone to participate, but uh, we are working on it because we'd like for uh, every child to have the opportunity to come and have their two-week summer camp program in Armenia. Uh, so we're going to do our best to make sure we can accommodate everyone. We have the funding for 400 students, but um, again, we're working on it. Um, our youth ambassador program, which is something I mentioned earlier on, a program that uh, we basically had the concept developed and presented it to one of our partners in the U.S. to the GMG Foundation, who graciously funded, uh, is a two-week global young ambassadors program. We have funding for five individuals, and the idea is to create a dynamic network of youth that are both uh, working in and for the diaspora and for the homeland. Uh, the application process will open on June 1st and will go until June 25th. And the program itself will take place from September 26th to October 9th. I have to say that this is a, a great time uh, to visit Armenia because the summer heat is no longer there. And Kind of pleasant. Um, just a little more detail on this program. The idea is to offer young active Armenian community members the opportunity to come to Armenia and participate in a series of lectures, workshops, and meetings to increase their knowledge about the most pressing political, social, and economic issues in Armenia, as well as to gain a deeper understanding about community engagement, participation, and advocacy. Thereby, the program will prepare the youth to produce and publish media content in local and international outlets, in addition to planning and implementing community meetings and repatriation talks in the various Armenian diaspora communities that they represent. Um, we hope that the program will blend theoretical and practical work and be useful involved and, and obviously give them an outlet for their meetings and their interact feelings. Um, an update on the COVID-19 situation in Armenia. As you know, uh, Armenia has relaxed its its uh, constraints and its limits uh, due to the COVID situation. Uh, and it's we're in the active uh, vaccination stage now. There are vaccinated quite easily in Armenia. The, the problem that we're facing currently is more convincing people to actually get vaccinated than getting hold of enough vaccines. Um, and uh, the number of those vaccinated is growing, but it's not growing nearly as fast as it should. Because obviously the trend is for everyone to get vaccinated, and unless you are, you're going to have problems it's going to be impossible to go anywhere. And we also, obviously, more and more importantly, 
he didn't want our patriots, whether in Armenia or in the diaspora, being, to be healthy, to be protected against COVID-19. I personally uh, also got vaccinated. I could have got, get, gotten a vaccine in the US, but I wanted, as a matter of principle, to do it in Armenia to follow my example and, and uh, proactively go and get vaccinated. So every adult in my family has gotten vaccinated. That is the response. But what uh, are the limitations on travel uh, under these COVID-19 situations? Uh, anyone who receives a COVID-19 vaccine doses and obtains a vaccination certificate or a green passport, as they call it, uh, will not need to take a PCR test upon travel. You just have to have proof. Those that have not been fully vaccinated, for example, I um, have gotten my first dose, um, my second dose on the 7th of July, so I'm not fully vaccinated. Uh, so those like me, which many I'm sure, must present the document confirming the results of a negative COVID-19 test. So anyone who hasn't been vaccinated at all or is partially vaccinated has to take a COVID-19 test no more than 72 hours before trip. If you arrive without such a uh, document, can be that and you can be uh, tested on the premises at Zavartman's airport. PCR tests from various testing institutions are available on the spot, very fast and very efficient, and, and do not pose difficulty or they're not inconvenient. It's actually been made very convenient for traveling to Armenia. But of course, again, we want to encourage folks to get vaccinated. A uh, question that's often asked is whether newborns or infants have to be vaccinated. Uh, well, anyone below the age of one does not uh, need to be vaccinated. Those over the age of one have to get, oh, I'm sorry, do, do not have to be tested, but those over the age of one do have to get a PCR test, whether 72 hours before travel or uh, on location. That's those are the, the rules of traveling and farming. Uh, a lot of questions have been asked about uh, the upcoming uh, extraordinary elections happening on June 20th. And folks are asking, can they vote? How can they vote? Who can vote? Uh, obviously, number one condition for voting is Armenian citizenship. If you hold an Armenian citizenship passport, you can vote, but you can only vote in Armenia, you have to be in Armenia in order to be able to vote, cast a vote. A lot of people have a problem with it. Well, uh, that's a constitutional requirement. The Constitution was amended in 2005 and then amended once in 2015, whereby this limitation or this requirement was imposed. Uh, the logic behind the, the, the uh, requirement is that uh, folks who aren't living in Armenia and therefore not bearing any responsibility for their votes and their political decisions and who can impose their will on those that live in Armenia um, shouldn't have the ability to do so. And actually making, you know, taking, making the effort and actually physically coming to Armenia to vote shows a degree of commitment to Armenia's future and uh, thereby is that we have a um, Uh, so, if you intend to come and vote, I believe you have to submit a, a letter to Ovir, and within three days, you'll be included in the voting process. The application must be completed in person, signed and submitted to Ovir. If you cannot personally submit an application to Ovir or receive your certificate of inclusion, then an authorized person can do it for you. The diaspora Armenians who are citizens of the Republic vote but are not registered can submit their application to OVI starting May 31st uh, and ending June 10th. So you have about a 10 day period in which you can submit your application to be included in the voting process. And actually take part in the um, Those are my updates. Uh, if there's 
there's questions that need to be asked. And I'm happy to answer those questions. That's both. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with Q&A. So uh, first question is, uh, which sources should we turn to for the most up-to-date information on what's going on in Armenia and Pakistan? Um, um, okay, that's a great question because information has become, or good information or uh, reliable information is highly problematic today in our Armenian reality. Um, the media, space is uh, largely controlled by a certain force, uh, force associated with the former regimes. They not completely controlled, they dominated heavily uh, because they have the financial means to do so. And uh, this, this creates a, um, a um, dissonance in Nation space where one is bombarded with negativity and negative information day in and day out, every minute, every day. Thousands of paid agents are, are posting information uh, with with the uh, clear aim of clear aim of uh, creating panic and creating um, apathy and disillusionment and hopelessness and. Uh, in many cases, information that they are receiving is clearly from Azerbaijan and Turkey. The links, it's very easy to make the links where they So having said that, um, obviously, government sources for information are reliable, I believe. Uh, but, you know, that may be perceived as being partial. Uh, so therefore, you know, I have my own list of sources from which I, I take information because I, I believe they're not governmental, they're actually they're very critical of the government. And I believe very objective. So if you don't want to get your information from uh, Armenian public television, uh, you know, then you do have the choice of sources like CivilNet, sources like EVN Report, sources like Head, sources like um, Arachin AM. So these are some of the sources that we can use. Maybe that both the vast number of so-called opposition sources and the government sources that are highly objective and reliable. Right, what's the next question? Great, thanks for that. And um, question. Uh, would it be possible to comment on the diaspora office's involvement in the upcoming
Apologies again, everyone. We're trying to reconnect. Um, this lightning is unwavering. <laughs> um, but uh, Mr. Sandan, so uh, the question was, would it be possible to comment on the diaspora office's involvement in the upcoming United AI World Conference uh, in June? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I want to you know, say a few words of gratitude and encouragement to all the organizations that participated in the creation of the United AIO. Uh, it's very important to note that this, this is a kind of a grassroots effort, meaning organizations came together realizing we need to have a common platform for various nonprofits, various organizations involved in the uh, Armenian space. And um, they seem to have done a very good job because pretty much every organization that we met with in the US uh, was excited about it. They're part of the United AIO and uh, we, all we can do is just embrace it and be happy to work with it. And we're, I know our staff has been in close contact with United AIO in terms of the conference. We're there uh, in every uh, way, every capacity to support United AIO, and we'll do so because we it's a very good organization, very good idea, it's a lot of promise. So kudos for putting it together. We're here to as a force multiplier. Whatever needs to be done to make sure that the organization succeeds has longevity and can produce tangible results. Thank you, Mr. And um, next questions. Um, here's a brief on, um, on the elections. Um, for diaspora Armenians who are not eligible to vote in the upcoming elections, what other ways can they get involved? Um, those uh, Armenians who want to be involved in various organizations that um, exist currently um, to, as, a, as an outlet for their, for their desire to, to be helpful and participate. Obviously, this depends on where they are and, and what, what's available out there, but I think everyone has an opportunity to participate in some organization and be helpful in one way or another. You know, I believe, and, and I've tried to live it, and not just talk about it. I believe that ultimately, those that are understand how important this period of our history is, and how important each individual's effort is in helping Armenia overcome the problems. The best way is to actually move. To it. Now, it's not the easiest thing to do. It's actually very hard. Trust me, it's very hard. I know it. But you gotta be on the ground. You have to be on the ground. You have to try to change things. If things aren't okay all around you, the uh, easiest thing to do is to sit in the bar and criticize. The hardest thing to do, the most responsible thing to do, is to actually come in, you know, get in there and try to at least hold your part of hold your part of the defense because otherwise. Things are things are going to be very dire. So, short of actually moving to Armenia and, and uh, being on the ground and doing your part uh, here, you know, contributing with professionally, culturally, in any way possible, uh, you know, folks can find an outlet for organizations. Again, the, I would encourage folks to follow United AIO's June conference and try to figure out where they fit in because they'll be presented with a myriad of ideas and myriad of organizations and each one will hopefully be constructive in terms of how they look like and what kind of questions where do you fit in in that mosaic of organizations and the work that's being done by the diaspora by the US
Thank you, Mr. And, uh, we all look forward to that conference very much. Um, another question from uh, Christoph Katsayan, who says, uh, hello, there were no meetings between Mr. Sinanyan and uh, the Armenian National Committee of America, the Armenian Assembly of America, um, and with Bej Satshrakyan, the head of AGBU. Uh, is there a reason for that? Uh, this is regarding your U.S. Uh, well, the premises of those questions are they did meet with AGBU. Or Bev Setrakian wasn't there at the meeting, but the rest of the board was. Phone conference with Bev Setrakian. Uh, we did meet with the uh, with some of the assembly groups. Yes, we had a meeting in Boston with Anthony Barcelona, and we are periodically having phone conferences with the uh, assembly folks. With the ANCA, you know, they have taken a very specific political role. Uh, and political position in Armenia, which uh, doesn't really correspond to their mission. They're supposed to be working in the US for Armenia. Uh, so uh, ANCA is, is another matter. They're controlled by an extreme wing of an organization in Armenia. And that's that. But we did have the, so two of the three premises of the question were one. Happy to update the person asking the question. Great. Uh, thank you. And um, switching over to um, current issues with borders, um, what would you say is the current situation uh, in Sunik? And uh, do you believe that Armenia's territorial integrity might be in jeopardy? Uh, so, Armenia's territorial integrity is in jeopardy today. It was in jeopardy yesterday. It will be in jeopardy tomorrow. We have to live with that assumption and function accordingly. When uh, there was a ceasefire in 1994, and the ceasefire was a favorable one for us, uh, folks kind of assumed that there was no jeopardy to our territorial integrity. 21 or the 2016 shorter war showed that we are in constant. So again, we need to build a state, state structures that are capable of facing and responding adequately to the challenges of tomorrow. So again, our territory is in jeopardy today more so than ever before because obviously we have chunk of our homeland, and now we are facing the enemy in Sunik and also in Yevat. So what's the situation there? Again, I, my information is not that much more than yours. Uh, the Azeris have come forward in three spots in Sunik and Yevat community, so they're legally the internationally recognized border. Apparently, some of them have withdrawn yesterday, but again, I don't have numbers. Volume, but they do remain on Armenian territory, and there's a concentration of both Armenian and Azeri military on both sides of that border. So, uh, as well as, uh, things are tense. Just a few days ago, there was a physical altercation with some Azeris who had tried to uh, violate another part of Sunni's border and as a result of an altercation on 11. Fortunately, it was not, you know, firearms were not used very much intentionally, but uh, we suffered 11 lightly injured soldiers. Injured in the fight was basically this fight. And the Azeris suffered close to 30. Injuries. So Thirty people were injured. And we were able on, in that part to put them back. So the Azeris are poking and uh, and pressuring Armenia. It, the reasons are numerous. I believe they're 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 trying to push the envelope and see how much more they can actually get out of Armenia. Uh, also, they're trying to influence the elections. In Armenia. There's a clear cooperation between the fifth column in Armenia and the Azeris. And they're trying by applying this pressure to 
influence the results of the, the outcome of the election in a very certain way. Um, and they'll continue to do so at least until the election. Uh, but we need to stand fast, involve all the necessary players, hopefully not trigger another war, or not allow them to really provoke us, them to trigger a war. But um, our borders are our borders. It's not an inch of land that we can give up. Um, and related question, um, is the establishment of a border security zone expected? There's so much talk in the air about what is expected and what's being discussed. Um, I think a border security zone would be a good thing. And again, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't have facts, military facts on the ground, but to, the demilitarizing part of the border, thereby making it impossible for Azeris to provoke war or provoke altercations. And it's my hope and belief that the foreign ministry and defense ministry are doing what they need to be doing to make sure that the end result, whatever it is that the end result is going to be, is going to maximize our security, minimize the threat and minimize the threat of Okay. Uh, and what makes the upcoming election? Well, these upcoming elections are obviously following up on military defeat, therefore um, and, and the resulting instability on the borders and instability in Armenia. Uh, and therefore, they're unique in this way. They're unique because just two years ago, the Armenian people voted, gave a mandate to a certain government. And on June 20th, they're going to have the opportunity to vote once again and decide What's important, what's very, very important, that these elections are held democratically and freely, uh, and that uh, criminal elements are not allowed to engage in vote buying and terrorizing people one way or another, uh, to influence the vote through any illegal means, as they have done numerous occasions since 1995, and that. At least this one achievement of the post-2018 period, which is the democratic vote, allowing people to vote for elections, that achievement is protected. Folks can vote whoever they want to, whoever they want to, uh, to run the government, uh, so long as they're actually allowed Thank you, Mr. Um, I'm going to do COVID-19 real quick again. Um, for those who didn't um, hear this during the presentation, um, so if you could repeat it once again, but um, if you are not fully vaccinated, can you take a COVID-19 PCR test upon your arrival at Zavatnaz Airport? Uh, yes. Uh, if you are not fully vaccinated or not vaccinated at all, you are required to, and you can take a PCR test either 72 hours prior to your arrival to Armenia or on the spot at Zavartnot's airport in Yerevan. It's very convenient. There are about 12 different uh, testing companies, medical companies on site who test you very fast and you do receive your results within four to five hours. You don't have, have to actually wait at the airport for your results. Uh, you can go to whatever your destination is, whether it's home or hotel, um, so long as you quarantine yourself for those next four to five hours until you get the results of your test. So 
we've made everything possible for him to have our uh, both compatriots travel to Armenia as well as tourists to be able to come to Armenia and, and be safe at the same time. And um, a related question, uh, which vaccines are currently available in Armenia and who's allowed to get the vaccine? Uh, there are three vaccines that are available. One is the AstraZeneca, the other is Sputnik V, and the other one is Sinovac, which I believe is the Chinese vaccine. I personally use AstraZeneca uh, quite easily. Quite easy. There are several mobile vaccination stations throughout the city. Um, and I see not only Armenian citizens being vaccinated, but also tourists who come to Armenia. Obviously, I'd rather Armenian citizens get vaccinated, uh, or at least Armenian tourists get vaccinated. Uh, but you see many foreign tourists, foreigners, be vaccinated. And the reason I say I'd rather Armenian citizens get vaccinated is because it is the Armenian government that's incurred the expense of uh, Acquiring these vaccines. Therefore, it makes sense that our residents and our citizens are vaccinated. But in any case, anyone can be vaccinated. It's very easy. It's very fast. Thank you, Mr. Sinanyan. And um, what can you tell us about the rumors of a new agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Um, Rumors, uh, again, at the last government session on Thursday, it was revealed that there are discussions about the setting up a demarcation. Uh, so the rumors are really about that, the setting up of a demarcation agreement uh, commission. Um, and I don't have much more info that I can share with, with our compatriots. I just don't have information, period. Uh, but document that has been now publicized uh, nearly states that such a commission will be created to look at Armenia's and Azerbaijan's borders. Now, um, Armenia has made the full withdrawal of all Azeris from Sunik and, and Gavar Kunik and all territories of Armenia as a precondition for any talks about the establishment of any such commission. So, Unless the Azeris withdraw, he is not going to be. Thank you, Mr. Sinanyan. And a uh, related question which, What steps should the Armenian authorities take to restore the diaspora's trust? And is it possible in the near future? Well, the. the Whatever is done has to be organic. It has to be done in hard work. It has to be done with a lot of cooperation. Uh, Armenia, first of all, the Armenian government, this government, next government, go on after that, need to listen to them. The Armenian government needs to really fully understand diaspora's and the promise that it holds for Armenians. Um, don't believe that any government has really fully done so, and efforts, um, and that's a problem. So, really working closely, not not being lip service, but actually working with the diaspora, actually addressing the diaspora's needs, and speaking really and honestly, that's very important. Unless that happens, this process is not going to lead. Um, and again, the answers should be honest either way. Uh, it, it's not a matter of merely, well, what is the Armenian government doing? It's also a matter of what is the diaspora doing. Uh, again, the conversation has to be a two sided conversation, it has to be very honest. Uh, one of the things that I'm being told wherever, uh, wherever I go, Russia, whether it's the US, folks don't understand why the ministry. And I, I tend to agree. Now, before someone jumps on this and says, well, you know, Sinanya wants to be a minister. Actually, I would not be able to be a minister because the constitution would not allow me to be. So uh, that's not where I'm coming from at all. 
again, I'm coming from the perspective of what does Armenia need vis-a-vis -vis diaspora. Again, just merely having a ministry doesn't solve the problem because we had a ministry for 10 years. And then what? And what was the result? What was, what was the point? Where is the infrastructure of our new diaspora relations? We have created 10 times more programming in the last two years than the diaspora ministry has created. So merely creating a ministry is not enough, but it is necessary. It is necessary. And the diaspora uh, needs to feel appreciated, needs to feel like it's being taken seriously, like it's important, because it is important, because it should be taken seriously, because it does hold the answer to all of our these problems. Whatever gaps there are in the field in Armenia, in the professional field in Armenia, um, the diaspora, and those gaps are huge, they're enormous. So, again, um, it has to be an organic strengthening of relations based on work, based on results, based on mutual understanding. The last thing the diaspora can do is, especially organizations that have for 25 years never made a peep about the horrible corruption, about the crime in Armenia, about uh, oligarchs with their bodyguards and murdering people in restaurants, their own party members. So before the diaspora gets itself into that mode or, or certain organizations, they need to be concerned to understand what, what it is there for. Uh, and fortunately, I'm grateful that the vast majority of diaspora, the vast majority of diaspora organizations are in that mode of thinking. They are worried and they should be worried, but they're worried in a constructive way. They want to be helped. They want to uh, contribute to fixing the numerous problems that exist in our problems that are uh, so deep, so culturally deep, so historically deep that they're going to take the concentration of all of our strength. The easiest thing to do is to get on Facebook and write some nasty comment or something. And only the lowest and the most uneducated, the, the most undignified humanoids do that. Don't do that. Be productive. Stand with your homeland. Show that you actually are something more than just an internet warrior. Uh, it takes comfort in insulting me. Show my work what it is they already keep for your homeland. So again, I want to go back to um, organizations like these new created structures of the United AIO as an example of folks coming together and saying, look, we have a problem. We're all trying to help. How about we talk to each other and figure out how we can help better together, or at least be aware of what each one of us is doing. And there's no duplication of effort, there's no redundancy. There are no um, gaps that are created because everyone's concentrating on the same. So uh, some very good processes are taking place in diaspora. I think diaspora is realizing its own strength, realizing the importance of the moment, and realizing that Armenia needs it more so than ever before. Um, and uh, I want to thank them. I want to encourage them to continue their hard work. And we're here to support them. Thank you, Mr. And um, from your U.S. trip, uh, what is the state of U.S.-Armenian relations currently? Um, it seems that the Biden administration uh, seems to express a greater attentiveness to Armenian interests, you know, especially considering um, recent recognition of the Armenian genocide. Um, so what path should the Armenian community in the United States take to continue building upon that relationship? Um, well, you know, uh, I think it's apparent and clear to everyone that this administration is much more receptive to uh, Armenian and Armenian issues. The previous one was the previous one was notoriously anti-Armenian. Uh, just as a reminder, I remind you that uh, they went from parity in providing military aid to Armenia and Azerbaijan, which was 
Obama administration policy to providing 10 times more military aid to Azerbaijan than to Armenia. Biden's budget, I'm sorry, Trump's budget included $100 million of military aid to Azerbaijan and really pickets to Armenia. Uh, this new administration has shown more engagement and more willingness to be objective on several occasions now. What was the uh, the term genocide by President Biden. The other was obviously a strong statement made by the National Security Advisor uh, regarding uh, Azerbaijan's encroachment on its sovereign territory. Um, and um, this, this is something that our media needs to latch on to. And, build upon. Now, some of these things are much harder to do than you can imagine because then we have another neighbor uh, who's very sensitive, I'm trying to, to use very careful words, very sensitive for me trying to develop any relationship with anybody. Um, and uh, Armenia's efforts to cooperate with countries like the US and France, two countries that have been very vocal about condemning Azerbaijan's uh, aggressive position on Armenia, um, is often meeting with counteraction by other countries. So therefore, um, yes, the Biden administration is much more receptive and work with them much closer, but we have to be the way we do it because at the end of the day remember when the azeris and the turks attacked armenia in 2020 everyone remained silent everyone remained silent and that was of course the result of uh our own uh, inability for 20 uh 26 years to build a diplomatic umbrella around that. we have to face our own failures can't just blame others for our failures. Uh, even when other countries, third countries, are using a lot of pressure on Armenia and are not really living up to their their obligations, even that is a result of us allowing them to do so by the way we behave since independence. So, a lot of work to be done, a lot of hard work under the most difficult circumstances now. Best time in our history was completely squandered, uh, and now we have what we have, and it's under these circumstances now that we have to come up on and have to come up. And it's going to take a lot of work. So anyone who's out there who actually genuinely wants to help uh, be part of this process uh, is hero for me, uh, as opposed to all those people that are out on the internet rabble rousing trying to, you know, get a name uh, or somehow have some other intentions are not at all. They don't contribute anything to increasing Armenia's security, increasing Armenia's ability to confront a very, very difficult. Thank you, Mr. Sidanian. And uh, today, the Bright Armenia Party spoke about uh, the constitutional reforms that affect the diaspora. Um, will the current government express uh, any thoughts, or is it part of their platform um, to talk about constitutional reforms to increase involvement of the diaspora? Um, and before the war, the Armenian uh, government had undertaken the process of Initiating constitutional reforms, and it was our position that we were going to insist on the removal of several provisions in the constitution that make it difficult for diasporans to be even deeper and easier involved in Armenian processes, through political processes, professional processes. Now, since uh, the war, that process has really stopped. No one's talking about constitutional reforms in, in actual terms. Of, you know, deadlines and things happen and such. Uh, 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we should stop. And in this, in this, our office uh, seeks the support of the diaspora. We, I, we seek the support and the pressure from the diaspora to get rid of these impediments that were, by the way, created by the 2005 and the 2015 amended constitutions. Those are the amendments that are now uh, stopping the bird diaspora. So we need the support of the past, and the past needs to demand those things that it views are necessary in order to resolve uh, integrated and, and better and deeper involved in our media. Um, and also structural reforms. Everywhere I go, folks tell me that they want the ministry to be back. Well, I tell them, okay, you want the ministry to be back, take action. Make that part of the conversation. Demand the recreation of the ministry of the diaspora. It's very important if that's the position. Make that a demand. Make that a part of the agenda. And we're there to, to support. I, um, I've now taken an open position that I agree with the diaspora that the ministry is a better approach. So, we seek your support. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sinaya. And this June uh, marks two years uh, that the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs has been around. And uh, what are your general thoughts about the office's successes? And um, do you believe that there should be a, an actual Ministry of Diaspora? Uh, I'm sorry, I, asked me to, I, I lost, I couldn't hear you. You said two years since the establishment of the office. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, let me go ahead and ask you a question. So uh, this June marks two years of the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. Um, what's your general thoughts about the office's successes and do you believe that there should be an actual Ministry of Diaspora? I think I answered that question. So at least the second part of it, I already answered. It's not what, what I want. I, I'm only reflecting upon Amplifying what I'm hearing. Again, it should be a ministry. I can't be the minister. Uh, but that doesn't matter. It's not about me. It's not about uh, Sarah and Jargonian. It's about institutions. It should be a ministry, uh, but it should be substantive. Because we had a ministry before. Very questionable. Certainly, no infrastructure whatsoever dealing with that deep issues, not just passing out medals and uh, commendation medals. Uh, the, in terms of two years of achievements, I'll tell you, these were the two years from hell. To be honest, it was eight months of normal work. Really, a lot of that time was taken up by transition from ministry to because the ministry, we had to go through some major changes. Uh, and then, of course, COVID hit, which had a huge impact on our activities because it physically cut off the diaspora. And then, of course, there was the war, which has consumed us, uh, consumed the beginning of our army, but also the structures. We've tried to stay focused on our activities because, again, I personally can't impact the situation in Syria. I can't impact the situation with the defense minister. And I don't lead negotiations with the Azeris or the Russians. We do what we do, and we try to make sure at least that our position uh, is secure. I look at this whole thing as uh, frontline during a war because we are in uh, and other people are holding their trenches. We're holding our trench. We're responsible for our trench, just trying to make sure our trench is uh, Unfortunately, our organization is not powerful enough for us to ban the other trenches as well. We try to do what we can do within the means that are provided to us and under very, very difficult circumstances. But having said that, again, we have created fantastic programs in this very short time period. We did retain Al-Depitunko. 
R2. It's a good program. We've improved upon it. We retained it. But since then, we've also created a marquee program that we have, which is built, which is an embodiment of our vision of how things should work. The Aspen professionals come in. They not only work in the public sphere, in the private sphere, but also work for the public sphere. They work for the government to improve the quality of governance. Uh, and I tell you, it's not the easiest thing to do. A lot of people in Armenia, a lot of the government are hostile to this. They, uh, they resent the idea that someone else is going to come from the outside and actually be better than them. And frankly, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less because all I want is for things to get better in Armenia. And this is how I see part of the solution. We've created, uh, we're creating, we're in the process of creating the Armenian map of the diaspora, which is our database on who's in the diaspora, which is going to be a very powerful tool, very powerful tool that should have been created two months back. But we're doing it, we initiated it, although I'm not sure our jurisdiction is the, the proper one to do it. We're doing it. Um, we're now creating the Armenian um, Repatriation Integration Center. Under these circumstances, when everyone's talking about migration and panicky, you know, everyone's panicking and, and the media is just trying to create such a dreadfully dark image of Armenia where anyone living in Armenia should just leave because of this. They're doing their best to make sure that people leave Armenia. And in all of this, we're doing our best to make sure that people we're going against the flow because we can never have joined the flow. So we're trying to create a center that's going to make it easy for the patriots to, after they move to our new country, set their lives going. And it's a major undertaking, should have been done 30 years ago. No one lifted a finger. We're doing it. And here I want to thank Paul Nanyang Foundation for being our partner. And for really, really deeply understanding this process and uh, being so uh, willing and so ready to assist us in this work. Um, and there are many other programs um, that we're working on implementing uh, to make sure that these the twin directions of the Office of the High Commissioner, which is full integration in diaspora and Armenia and repa repatriation, those two processes are ongoing um, despite what may happen otherwise we have to move forward we have to man our, our trench we have to defend our line that was a long question to an otherwise short uh, long answer to an otherwise short question Thank you. And to conclude, is there anything else you'd like to say to our compatriots in the diaspora? Uh, no, I just want to say that we'd love to see you all in Armenia this summer almost. So I know a lot of you will be traveling. And uh, well, Yerevan in Armenia is not the same without you. You have to come. You have to come. You have to set foot. Uh, the homeland and you will feel much more calm and empowered and see that the situation is not as hopeless as it may seem if you live in the Facebook world. The Facebook world is controlled by the Azeris and Turks and by the fifth columnists that serve their places. Come to Armenia, experience it yourself, see it yourself. Um, and I uh, want to thank every other, every organization that, that's out there doing things for their homeland. We're doubling down at this very difficult time. So instead of withdrawing, instead of um, basically fleeing, they're doubling down. Uh, many of these organizations have lost a lot of the work product that they've created, a lot of the properties they created, a lot of work that they created. Uh, a great example is the Armenian Education Fund. And yet they move, forward. they move forward because they realize that there's only one woman. We have to do everything to prevent any further loss. And we have to prepare to reverse that loss.
at some point. But in order to do that, we have to prepare. We can't allow a, a repeat of what happened from 94 to, to 2018, um, where no preparation was taking place. And folks were becoming wealthy, government uh, officials were becoming billionaires, while a million and a half people were leaving the home. Or the best talents were leaving the home. And we can't have that happen again. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, thank you, Hasnik. And hope to see you soon. You know, whoever I didn't see in LA, hope to see you in Yerevan. Uh, we can overcome any problems that we have. As long as we're together, we can go ahead. We have a clear plan of action. And just move forward. Absolutely. To echo Mr. Sinanian, uh, hope to see you all uh, in the homeland this summer and forever. Um, so uh, thank you all for tuning in again. You can. Um, this live was actually recorded, so if you missed if you missed it, you can go ahead and listen in at any time. Uh, just going onto our Facebook page, and it'll also be uploaded on our website. Um, for any questions, feel free to go ahead and email us. Um, also, you can shoot us. Uh, a message in our chat on the website. Um, we have a ton of social media networks as well. So would love to stay in touch with everyone in the diaspora and um, continue our relations. Thank you all.